Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Thursday, June 3rd, we are studying Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 1 to 17. Jeremiah complains before the Lord that the treacherous are thriving while he, the faithful prophet, is suffering, even at the hands of his own family members. The Lord steals Jeremiah for further suffering, even while the Lord calls Judah, Jerusalem, and all nations to true faith in him. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Mark Squire. Pastor Squire serves at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in St. Ansgar, Iowa. Pastor Squire, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thanks, Tim. It's good to be with you again, although I should say that, you know, following the likes of people like Reed Lessing and uh, Tim Seleska, it's kind of like going from a porterhouse to a, a veggie burger or something. So <laughs> I hope hope I'm able to, uh, to serve your listeners okay. <laughs> well, we, we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before. It, it certainly was a, a joy to talk to both of those men, and it uh, it's, it's amazing how I, I continue to learn from the book of Jeremiah. So looking forward to, to chatting with you about the prophet today. We're in Jeremiah 12 today. It's perhaps not the most familiar chapter of Jeremiah. What do we need to know about the prophet, his ministry, the context within the book that'll help us into chapter 12 today? Yeah, well, like you said, chapter 12 is, is not one of the most familiar chapters to us, and really Jeremiah isn't necessarily even the most familiar prophet to us. I was just looking through the hymnal earlier today, and in the one-year lectionary for the churches that use that, Jeremiah only comes up four times, and you know, one of those times is in Holy Week. It's like Tuesday of Holy Week, so most people probably don't even hear that reading uh, and then even in the three year, we have 14 instances of Jeremiah. And so we don't get to hear Jeremiah all that often, especially when you compare him to, say, Isaiah, which we hear just dozens of times all throughout the church year in, in either series. But Jeremiah is important, and, and we look forward to how he um, points forward to Jesus and the coming of the Messiah, the King, the prophets. Um, kind of play off one another, but also in the New Testament, you have the apostles and, and the disciples who are quoting Jeremiah uh, about 40 times, and oftentimes in Revelation uh, regarding Babylon. So Babylon, of course, becomes a very important player in all of this and in Jeremiah's life and ministry because they're sort of the looming threat uh, to the southern kingdom of Judah. So when you're looking through Jeremiah, which is, as you've uh, heard if you've been listening uh, to these podcasts, uh, uh, the longest book in the Bible, word for word, uh, even though it doesn't have the most chapters. There's a lot in Jeremiah and uh, a lot of story, a lot of poetry, a lot of prophecy. And, and as you said, kind of in the intro there, a lot of complaining, although not really in the sense that we use the word complaining. You know, We might use the word complaining sort of to imply whining, but Jeremiah really isn't whining so much as he, he really has a, a real uh, a real beef. He's going through some tough stuff, some, uh, some real persecution, some real difficult times that uh, most of us would not you know, wish on our worst enemy. We're going to see Jeremiah's complaint, as you said, and I appreciate you you know, saying this isn't whining, because I do think that is how we're prone to think about it as, you know, maybe, I don't know if that's as Americans or that's just the way we, we hear it today, that, you know, and, and as we listen to Jeremiah today, I mean, it it almost sounds impious to us, but it's a very scriptural way of, of talking, and I know that we'll we'll dig into that. In terms of just the the situation of chapter twelve in the book, and and maybe in Jeremiah's ministry, I know it's it's difficult from chapter to chapter and even from section to section to always place where this happened in Jeremiah's ministry. Do we have an idea of, of where this complaint or this lament of Jeremiah's in chapter twelve takes place? 
that's always the question with with Jeremiah, just you know, looking through the book and, and some resources that Jeremiah really isn't chronological in a way that we might appreciate as you know modern Western people. We kind of like to have uh, our our stories in order. We like to move from point A to point B to point C in in a timeline. But Jeremiah doesn't do that. He he seems to be all over the place. We have some narration throughout the book and kind of goes back and forth. And chapter 12 is one of those places where we're not quite sure exactly where this is in his ministry. It really could be just about anywhere. And when you think of what Jeremiah is saying here as we kind of get into it, you see that this this really could fit in in just about any part of his decades-long ministry because he really is facing opposition at just about every turn and when he looks around, uh, what he sees does not please him. It does not jive with, with the justice and righteousness that, that the Lord God expects from his people. Now, I, I would suspect that this probably is happening before the exile, uh, before kind of the, what you would call the worst that comes with the Babylonians surrounding and laying siege to Jerusalem. I think it's, it's probably fair to say that this, this complaint comes during his his ministry and his attempts to bring the word of the Lord to the people to get them to repent, even though, you know, if you're reading through the first part of Jeremiah, especially you see that it's obviously not going to happen. The people are not going to repent. And I think Jeremiah is really feeling the weight of that right now. In terms of the the previous chapter, chapter 11, what's the what's the connection this i mean we kind of the chapter divisions are not always the the best sometimes they're they're pretty good here it seems that that we're kind of actually in the middle of jeremiah's complaint what's the what's the carryover from chapter 11 into the verses we've got today it seems that this this section really begins most neatly around verse 18 of chapter 11 if you look back if you have your bibles and and you open up Back to chapter 11, you see that there's some narration there for the first 17 verses where the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah and it details this broken covenant that the people, well, you know, they've broken the covenant with the Lord. And starting about verse 18, you see how Jeremiah really starts his his complaint. And he says, the Lord made it known to me and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds, but I was like a gentle lamb led to slaughter. So really some extreme imagery there. And of course, as we get into chapter 12 as well, we start to see some pretty powerful connections between Jeremiah and our Lord Jesus. You know, that's very familiar language that we might attribute to, say, Isaiah chapter 53, where Isaiah is is giving his servant song and, and he describes the Lord as, as a lamb being led to slaughter. So yeah, Jeremiah's complaint really does begin uh, near the end of chapter 11. And he seems to continue on here into the first four verses or so of, of chapter 12 before you see the Lord answer. And it's interesting because when we when we get there, you don't see any change in, in subject, but it really, it seems to have to be that the Lord is is the one who's who's answering here, almost like you might expect in, in the book of Job, where Job has some similar complaints, obviously, for different reasons, but uh, near the end of the book of Job, you start to have this back and forth between Job and the Lord. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the challenges in in the Old Testament, particularly in the poetic sections. The book of Psalms really comes to mind as to knowing who is talking to whom, and, and sometimes it's yeah. not as... It's not as neat as we would do it in, in most English works today where, you know, Pastor Squire said, quotation mark, Pastor Apple said, quotation mark. It's, it's sometimes a little more fluid than that, particularly in the poetic sections, which is what we have for the most part in chapter 12. But I think you're right that, that verses 5 and following really have to be the Lord's response to what Jeremiah is, has been saying already in chapter 11 and what he gets going with at the beginning of chapter 12 today. So let's go ahead and, and read the text. This is Jeremiah 12, verses 1 to 17, which is the entirety of chapter 12. Jeremiah says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you, yet I would plead my case before you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? 
You plant them and they take root. They grow and produce fruit. You are near in their mouth and far from their heart. But you, O Lord, know me. You see me and test my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn and the grass of every field wither? For the evil of those who dwell in it, the beasts and the birds are swept away because they said, he will not see our latter end. If you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? And if in a safe land you are so trusting, what will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? For even your brothers in the house of your father, they even they have dealt treacherously with you. They are in full cry after you. Do not believe them, though they speak friendly words to you. I have forsaken my house. I have abandoned my heritage. I have given the beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. My heritage has become to me like a lion in the forest. She has lifted up her voice against me, therefore I hate her. Is my heritage to me like a hyena's lair? Are the birds of prey against her all around? Go, assemble all the wild beasts, bring them to devour. Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it a desolation, desolate, it mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate, but no man lays it to heart. Upon all the bare heights in the desert, destroyers have come. For the sword of the Lord devours from one end of the land to the other. No flesh has peace. They have sown wheat and have reaped thorns. They have tired themselves out, but profit nothing. They shall be ashamed of their harvests because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Thus says the Lord concerning all my evil neighbors who touch the heritage that I have given my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them up from their land, and I will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. And after I have plucked them up, I will again have compassion on them, and I will bring them again, each to his heritage and each to his land. And it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn the ways of my people, to swear by my name, as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be built up in the midst of my people. But if any nation will not listen, then I will utterly pluck it up and destroy it, declares the Lord. That's Jeremiah 12, verses 1 to 17. Pastor Squire, Jeremiah's complaint, as it's titled in the ESV, really not the best title, as you said. Maybe Jeremiah's lament, Jeremiah's case, is maybe that's that's his own language. In verses 1 to 4, it begins, you know, he, he says, this is who you are, Lord. You are the righteous, but I'm going to plead my case. And the case is, is two questions, which are, I think are really very similar. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? This is a, a pretty common question in the in the scriptures, isn't it? It is, and it's a common question today, of course. This is one of the deepest questions that people can ask. You can look around in the world and see all the evil that goes on and wonder, why is this happening? Why are good people dying, and why are they afflicted, and why are evil people prospering? Why is, why is stuff going well for them? Uh, we could really spend the entire time here just talking about this one verse, I think. There's so much to dig into here. And even just the first words, he, he begins, of course, righteous are you, O Lord. And I think it's important you know, when you talk about him pleading his case, this is why he can plead his case. Because when we think of the word righteous, we might think of you know, pure or holy, and certainly the Lord is those things. But here, the word righteous particularly means that, that the Lord gives right judgment. So this, these ideas of righteousness and justice that pervade the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament and especially in the prophets, this is who the Lord is. He is right. And so he is the judge over all things, over all people. So, of course, if you want to have somebody give you a verdict and especially to give you vindication or redemption or recompense, it's going to be Yahweh, the Lord. And like you said, this is very common. So especially throughout the Psalms, uh, through the prophets, you have people who are pleading their case before the Lord. So you might think of, and this is Jeremiah again, Lamentations chapter one, 
he begins the verse in the same way. He says, Yahweh is in the right or Yahweh is righteous. So when you come with a complaint, you come knowing that the Lord is going to make the right judgment, which really, I think, sets the tone for this, that it, it is more than just, you know, like we talked about earlier, it's not whining, it's not complaining, as we might use the word today, but it really is almost more like a court case. This is Jeremiah as a, uh, not a prosecutor, but, um, you know, he's he's bringing something before the Lord and and maybe... I don't know if he wants answers so much, but he certainly wants things to be right again. He wants a judgment. He wants, he wants things to, to be the way that they should be. And the, the thing that's standing in the way of that, as you mentioned, Pastor Apple, are are these two questions. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? And uh, why do all who are treacherous thrive? These are similar questions, of course, and they call to mind many of the psalms. So you have these psalms that are labeled as complaint psalms. And again, in, in the best connotation of the word complaint. So you might look at Psalm 10 or Psalm 37 or Psalm 73 or Psalm 94. These different places where, whether it's David or Asaph or one of the psalm writers, who is bringing an honest complaint or case before the Lord. And that might be like here where, the wicked are prospering and the good are suffering. It might be um, something similar like David, who is running from Saul, who is being afflicted by Saul or somebody else in, in Israel. And he's wondering how long, how long is this going to go on? How long before you make things right and, and vindicate me and my, my own righteousness or my own situation? uh, Because I don't, this, this shouldn't be happening. You know, things are out of whack and we need somebody to come. So you look at a place like Job 12 as well. So Job is another good example. Or even all the way at the end of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, you have these same concerns. And the prophets bring them up in all different sorts of ways. But like I said, even today, we, we feel this deep down in our bones, this this injustice that people who shouldn't do well because of their sin, because of their wickedness are doing the best. You know, they're taking advantage of people, paying them a pittance for their work or, you know, taking away their resources or whatever it might be. And so we can really relate with this. I think that even if we haven't maybe experienced it ourselves, we know what it looks like. Hmm. Yeah. I think, I think this, this first section, these first four verses are quite applicable. And I want to, I want to talk to you about that. Let's keep working our, our way through this. As Jeremiah continues his case, his evidence, and this is quite striking. You know, he says in verse two that you, O Yahweh, you are the one who are planting these wicked people. They're taking root because of your planting. They're actually growing and producing fruit. Now this, this sounds the opposite again of, of what we would expect. And even of, I mean, think back the language of planting and uprooting. There's going to be several times in this text, this whole chapter, where we get these callbacks to Jeremiah's call in chapter one. This language of planting is a part of it. Again, this Jeremiah is looking at the situation and saying, Lord, not only are you, I mean, this is what I, I think he's saying, not only are you letting this happen, but Lord, you're the one that planted them. That's what it sounds like he's saying. It is. And it really, when you, when you read through this chapter, this might be one of the most striking verses because Jeremiah identifies the Lord as the originator of this, as it were, in one way or another, like you said, that it's not as if evil is happening that that is not under his watch. But he, he goes so far as to say that you plant them, which, like you said, is not what we might expect because this idea of planting and taking root and bearing fruit usually is reserved for God's people. So the very first Psalm, for example, uh, you know, the person is blessed who isn't walking in the council of the wicked or standing in the way of sinners or sitting in the seat of scoffers, but who delights in the law of the Lord and so on. He's like a tree who is planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. So usually this this sense is that God plants his people and that's, and they are the ones who are supposed to bear fruit. But he's saying you Lord planted 
these wicked people, these treacherous people, and they are bearing fruit, uh, producing fruit. They are growing, despite the fact that he says, you are near in their mouth, but far from their heart. So Jeremiah identifies this hypocrisy that the people are giving lip service to the Lord. Even the wicked, treacherous people give lip service to, to Yahweh, but by their actions and by everything else that you know about them, you can see that they're hypocrites. They are wicked. They are treacherous. They are taking advantage of people. So it is, it is quite an accusation. And like you said, it does call us back to chapter one and, and Jeremiah's call because you have this, this scene of the almond tree, for example. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's the word of the Lord, too, that it's supposed to come and pluck out and break down, but also to build and to plant. And you would think that that would be the positive side of this, the good thing that he's going to plant his people. And yet Jeremiah is saying, no, you, you've also planted these treacherous people. And I think the thing is, he's, he's right. And nothing happens apart from the Lord's providence. And so it's actually something important for us to consider that when we, we look around at the world and all the evil that happens, we might be tempted to think that God is no longer in control or that God is not doing anything about it. And yet that's not true. God, God is in control and God is doing something about it and God has done something about it. It strikes me, you know, you're mentioning other places in the Old Testament where this comes up, the Psalms, and I, you mentioned a couple others. It seems like, I, I think that the the entire book of Habakkuk is about this question, and Habakkuk is likely a contemporary of Jeremiah, you know, and not to not to take us too far there, but just, you know, Habakkuk asked the question, Lord, very similar to, to Jeremiah, you know, what's, what's going on? Why are the w- wicked prospering? And the Lord's first answer to, to Habakkuk, at one point, he, you know, he says, well, don't worry, you know, I've, I've got it under control. I'm going to bring the the Babylonians. And, and Habakkuk comes along and says, well, that's worse. <laughs> that that doesn't yeah. sound right either, you know? I mean, but so it, it's, and, and then of course, in, in Habakkuk, and this is where, you know, Habakkuk is where you get the, the verse that Paul quotes in the New Testament, that the just live by faith. You know, the, this matter of righteousness comes through faith and, and trusting that, you know, in the midst of these moments where we look at the world and we 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 tell the Lord, this isn't right. Something's wrong here. What what's going on? That that we trust that that He does know, in fact, know what He's doing. That He knows His own. And and I think that's where Jeremiah goes in verse three to get us back into Jeremiah. So he says, but now he's he's going to make this turn, saying, this is what I see in the world, Lord. But but now look at me and know me. You know who I am. Test my heart. And so deal with my enemies. We, we got about a couple of minutes here before the break to, to dig into to verse three. Yeah. And I think, you know, you went forward to Habakkuk and that certainly, like you said, the the whole short book of Habakkuk is, Habakkuk is about that. And I, you know, going backwards then to say the book of Exodus, we actually have a good answer, not maybe not an answer as we might want to think about it, but certainly the Lord doing something about it. So, these words see and know occur at the end of Exodus chapter two, where the people of God are crying out because of their slavery and their harsh labor because of this new Pharaoh. And it it says there at the end of Exodus two, that the Lord saw and he knew, and these words are so important. He also remembers. So he's remembering his covenant, which means in the scriptures that he's about to do something about it. And I think that's where you naturally have to end up with this, that when the Lord sees and when the Lord knows, he's going to do something about it. So Jeremiah is calling for him to see and to know himself, but also I think to, of course, his his people, his remnant, his chosen ones, where he's calling God to see their affliction and to see that things are not right, that things are out of whack, and that something needs to be done about it, and it's only the Lord who can do something about it. And his doing something about it is going to come in the form of both his salvation for his people, but also his judgment on the treacherous, on the wicked, which we see in Exodus with the Egyptians, which we see uh, with 
the evil people in Israel with the, the people of uh, the armies of Babylon coming, but also throughout the scriptures and even at the end of the scriptures where God will ultimately chain up the evil one, our old evil foe, the devil, and all who followed him and bring his final judgment on them. Take us briefly into to verse four, Pastor Squire, before we get go to our break here. Just uh, how does how does Jeremiah wrap up this section of complaint, lament before the Lord? Yeah, so moving from three to four, where it, you know, as in three, he talks about this day of slaughter, which is again a strong image that is reflected in say Ezekiel chapter thirty four, where he talks about the shepherds being judged because they've not only taking advantage of the sheep, but they are devouring the sheep. He moves on to a slightly more you know, creation type of image where he talks about the grass of the field withering, the beasts and the birds being swept away. These bad things that are happening in creation are signs not only of God's judgment, but also these results of man's sin. And so we see throughout history, really, how the sin of people really does have a negative effect on creation. And so for Jeremiah, it's not just that he as a prophet and the remnant as a people are being afflicted and persecuted because of their faithfulness to Yahweh. But the question becomes, how long is this going to go on? So this is really how he wraps it up in chapter or in verse four, how long, right? How long will the land mourn? How long will the grass of every field wither for the evil of those who dwell in it? The beasts of the birds are swept away because they said, he will not see our latter end. And so this question of how long occurs all throughout the scriptures and in the complaint Psalms and Job in many places, it's this last phrase that in particular stuck out to me. He says, because they said he will not see. And it reminded me of Psalm 64, especially verse 5, because the wicked ultimately, you're, you're sinful because you haven't feared or loved or trusted in the Lord above all things. You know, we go back to the meaning from the catechism of the first commandment. Uh, you should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And these wicked and treacherous people are evil, certainly because of the terrible things they do to others, but ultimately because they assume that the Lord is not going to punish them for what they're doing. You know, he will not see, God will not see. So the wicked are assuming that no one can see them. And you get this sort of idea of light and darkness, of secrecy and openness that's pervasive throughout the scriptures, especially in John's gospel and John's letters. But God, as we just saw in verse three, he does see. So they can say all they want, he will not see, but the Lord himself has already said that he will see and he will know. So we'll see how Jeremiah is answered by the Lord on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFU. I have Pastor Mark Squire talking about Jeremiah 12. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233, 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharp Iron. It is Thursday, June 3rd. We're studying Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 1 to 17 with Pastor Mark Squire. He serves at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in St. Ansgar, Iowa. Pastor Squire, prior to the break, we're looking at verses 1 through 4, again titled in the ESV, Jeremiah's Complaint, His Lament. He prays in a couple ways that I think may strike us as strange as Christians today, though they shouldn't. They are scriptural prayers. But I'd just like to, before we move on from from this, how do we make use of prayers like this today where we would, when, when would we as Christians pray to the Lord, why do the wicked prosper, or even pray for the destruction of our enemies, as Jeremiah does in, in verse 3 of chapter 12? When are appropriate times, what are appropriate uses of these prayers in our lives as Christians still? 
That's a really good question because, as you said earlier, it can seem impious for us to pray like this. We're used to assuming that we should only speak in good terms or, you know, however you want to think about it. But these prayers are prayers, like you said, they're scriptural prayers, but when real affliction happens to us, it's important for us to call it what it is and you know, not to get too deep into theology apart from what we're doing here, but you think of being a theologian of the cross as opposed to a, a theologian of glory. You, know, you want to call something what it is. And if something bad is happening, as Christians, we are called to call something what it is. So whether it's affliction that's happening to us or whether it's something that's just out of whack with creation, it's important for us to identify that something is wrong. In part because, in big part because, if these aren't really problems, then the good news of Jesus isn't really that big of a solution. And I think that's been one of the best ways that it was ever put to me by pastors and professors is that the problem of sin and brokenness is not a big problem, then then Jesus really isn't that big of a savior. So part of this is is simply recognizing that there are real problems, there are big problems problems, whether they're personal or nationwide or cosmic problems. And when they're problems, they should drive us to the Lord. And I think that's the example of Jeremiah and David and Habakkuk and Job. It certainly can be taken too far where we are maybe complaining or whining or even questioning the goodness of the Lord. But it doesn't have to get there. We can simply pour out our lament and say, this is wrong. It needs to be fixed. And we come to the Lord doing that in faith. So that's exactly what Jeremiah does in verse 1. He calls the Lord righteous. The Lord is righteous. He knows what he's doing. He's in control, and he's going to make it right. And when you think about the other side of this that you asked uh, with the question that praying for, for example, the destruction of our enemies. Part of what we miss sometimes as Lutherans when we focus on the gospel as justification by grace through faith, the forgiveness of sins, that's all central to the gospel, of course. I'm not denying that. But the gospel in a broad sense means making everything right again. And that includes creation, and that includes God's people, and so, for example, and I'm trying to remember uh, which psalm it is offhand, but it's one of the creation psalms where uh, the psalmist is is describing in beauty all that the Lord has done. And you get to the end of the psalm, there's these last two verses where he says, you know, wipe, wipe sinners from the earth. <laughs> mm. And you think, well, where in the world did that come from? And yet a big part of the gospel is that God will vindicate his people by bringing judgment to his enemies. And in fact, the most quoted verse in the Old Testament in the New Testament is Psalm 110, verse 1, where um, the psalmist writes, you know, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And when, in this Easter season uh, and in Pentecost, where we think of Jesus' resurrection, and ascension. And what is Jesus doing right now? Well, he's reigning over his enemies. And so certainly we can't have the fullness of the gospel without God's ultimate justice and vindication, both for Jesus with his resurrection from the dead, and then for also also for God's people who are in Christ. That's a very helpful answer that, I mean, what else will we do with these laments, with these complaints, other than take them to the Lord who is the one who makes all things right in his son, Jesus Christ. Now, part of praying that to the Lord is the willingness to receive the answer that he gives as as the good one, to, to pray in that faith. The answer that the Lord gives to Jeremiah in verses five and six particularly, I don't, I mean, it's not as comforting as I think I would have liked, it's like, well, wait a second. But I mean, if, if I'm reading it right, it's basically the Lord saying, well, Jeremiah, you think it's bad now? Just wait, it's going to get worse. <laughs> is that I mean, is that what he says, basically? Pretty much, yeah. You think it's bad now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's 
when if you've raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? So Jeremiah has been facing a lot, and you see that even just in verse six. Even your brothers and the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. They are in full cry after you. You think of all the people opposing Jeremiah. It's it's almost even though maybe your family members aren't more powerful in a in a civil sense, it probably hurts more that your own house would be after you, despite the fact that he faces off against prophets and priests and and kings. Uh, even his his father and his his siblings or his extended family are against him. So yeah, the the answer here is. Well, Jeremiah, it's bad now, but it's going to get worse. Of course, though, the Lord isn't going to leave it there. And that's, I think, where God, like you said, we have to be willing to accept the answer that God gives. And God is going to give us an honest answer. And oftentimes that means it's going to be something that we don't want to hear right now. But he also gives us an eternal answer. And that's where, when you look at the rest of this, we at least get it implied what's going to come. The Lord is going to make it right, even if that means, as we might say today, things are going to get worse before they get better. Mm. I think, too, there at the end of verse 6, where the Lord says to Jeremiah, do not believe them, though they speak friendly words to you, is is maybe a, a bit of a callback, again, to the words of Jeremiah's call toward the end of that first chapter of Jeremiah, where where he told Jeremiah from the outset that all of the people of Judah, Jerusalem, the leaders in particular, here we're talking about his own family, but but that all the people would fight against Jeremiah and the words that he that he would speak. But the Lord promised Jeremiah from the beginning, they're not going to prevail against you because I'm with you. And so I, I think, you know, the Lord's honest with Jeremiah. The, the suffering that you'll experience is going to get worse. But remember, I am with you. Don't believe them. Don't trust them. Continue to trust me. And, and, and as you said, then, I mean, certainly putting that in the full context of this chapter and of everything that, that Jeremiah preaches to find the, the hope in all of that. Now, it, as, the, as the text continues into verses 7 and following, it, it seems that the Lord makes a turn as, as he continues to be the speaker now in verse 7. And the, one of the things that, that I notice, at least in these first couple of verses, I guess especially that first one, verse 7, is there's, there's quite a contrast. On the one hand, the Lord continues to call Judah and Jerusalem my house, my heritage, the beloved of my soul. And that word, my heritage, continues throughout the text. You know, the, the Lord says, these are my people. And yet the verbs that go with it are, are quite striking. I've forsaken I've abandoned. I've given them into the hands of of the enemies. This is language we've heard from Jeremiah previously. Uh, take us into this next section of text. I think you're right to point out that the Lord is using that that word "my," and it's an interesting distinction from other places in the Scripture where the Lord actually goes so far as to say, "These are not my people anymore." So I thinking backwards to the Exodus, where the people continually turn away from the Lord. And he finally tells Moses, basically, these are your people. These are <laughs> these are not my people. You know, your people have done this. Uh, but even looking forward to some of the other prophets, too, you have, what, Isaiah and Hosea, This these, these instances where God actually has the prophet name his child, uh, Lo Ami, not my people. Uh, which is pretty terrible to hear, of course. Um, and as strong as the language is here, that he's forsaken, that he's abandoned, he does still use the word my. So this is my house, this is my heritage, the beloved of my soul. And so there is still this connection between the Lord and his people. And there is still, as we're going to see at the end of the chapter, hope in a future the Lord is still going to be faithful to David, to his promises, to his word, that these are still going to be his people, despite the fact that they are forsaken, that they are abandoned, and they are, uh, what was the other word he used, that they've given them over to the hands of their enemies. So the people are going to be 
disciplined and the discipline is not going to be pleasant one bit. In verse eight, one of the the phrases there that strikes me is the very end where he, he says, therefore I hate her. What, how yeah. that, that word hate, I think in English has certain connotations that maybe aren't present in what the Lord is saying. What is it? When does, what does God mean when he says, I hate her? That's absolutely right. And just like with the translation of complaint, we have to be careful with the word because hate in our culture and in our time is such a strong word. And it usually implies that you have ill will towards and you want harm to come to somebody. You don't want to have anything to do with somebody. And the word that's translated as hate here in English generally means that you stand in opposition to. So it would be sort of the opposite of being a friend or an advocate. You're on the other side of the line that's been drawn in the sand. So the Lord doesn't hate his people, Israel, as we might use the word hate. But he stands now in opposition because the people have forsaken him. And so the heritage has become to me like a lion in the forest. She has lifted up her voice against me. Therefore, I hate her. So in other words, I'm standing opposed to them because of what they've done to me. They've turned away from me. And we actually... We see this in other places in the in the Old Testament, especially. And every time it's because the people have turned away from the Lord. They've committed idolatry. And as you've heard from some of your other guests earlier on in the book, you have this image of marriage and adultery. So the Lord was like a husband to the people. And they went around, and he uses the word whoring. They've been whoring around with other gods. So the Lord finds himself opposed now to his people. And I think when you see it like that, you you kind of get a better sense of what he's actually saying. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that, that image was very strong than the first couple of chapters of the book. The image here with the, the lion in the forest reminds me of, of the book of Amos at at the beginning of the book of Amos, the Lord roars from Zion. He's the lion. And it's like Jeremiah here pictures the people of Judah roaring back as if they could overpower the Lord's voice. And, And certainly that's been quite true in the book of Jeremiah. They've scorned the word of the Lord. They don't want to listen to it. And so, as you said, because of that action, then they have set themselves in opposition to the Lord. And so he, he is opposing them at this moment, but, but not in the sense that he hates them because he intends ill will toward them, but rather he's, he's going to give them what they want all for the purpose, as we'll see at the end of this text to call them back to himself. So, I mean, yeah, the, the English word hate probably doesn't communicate that as well as, as what we've just laid out. Now, Jeremiah continues with some of the, you know, more of this nature imagery. This is something we've seen Jeremiah do. He, he makes the, I think the picture in verse nine that, that I'm seeing, you know, this idea of a hyena's lair, you know, picture all the, maybe the, the half eaten carcasses around a hyena's lair. And then the birds of prey that are trying, or the, or the also, you know, like vultures and things like that, trying to pick off, any, any last bits. I mean, it's like everybody, because the Lord's people have set themselves against the Lord, then the Lord's just going to let all these other nations, Babylon particularly, have at the people of Judah and Jerusalem so that they become, I mean, it, it, the picture here, the word desolate or desolation is used several times there in verse 11. It's, we've seen him paint this picture before. He's doing it here again. Anything particular in, in the verses 9 through 13 in that imagery there that stands out, Pastor Squire? Yeah, so when you mention sort of these half-eaten carcasses around, it reminds me of, I know it's probably an older movie than we'd like to admit now, but if you've seen The Lion King, That's right. yeah. uh, you have these hyenas that, that come, and, and when Scar takes over, they, they just devour everything. And so when Simba finally comes back near the end of the film, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> Yeah, the hyenas have, have just eaten everything bone dry. So there's there's dry bones laying everywhere. There's no plant life. And hyenas become a symbol of these these scavenging animals that will eat even these these diseased and, and half-eaten carcasses and, and just pull everything dry. Along with these birds of prey or vultures, like you said, where they're opportunistic and they're going to, whatever, whatever is sitting around for them to eat, they're going to eat. And it's just, it's really a terrible, disgusting image that you have these dying, rotting 
animals laying around and these, these unclean animals that are devouring what's left mm. on top of the fact that he, he has this, this other creation imagery too, this other images like uh, shepherds and sheep. Uh, they've de- destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They've made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. And so, like you said, this word desolate, this, this word desolation is used several times here. And you just picture you picture a desert, you picture a barren land that comes as a result of the people's sin and, and from the Lord's judgment, which is then when you get into these gospel areas like Isaiah 35, for example, it's, mm. it's into this desolation that the Lord is able to speak his, his word of life, his renewal. And in, if you're in the three-year series, this reading from Ezekiel 37 comes up on the day of Pentecost, uh, which for the listeners would be what, a, a few several days before you're hearing this. But um, you know, thinking back to that, Ezekiel 37, you have just a valley of dry bones. And that's, that's kind of the image, I think, that, that we get here from, from Jeremiah in verses 9 through 13. Yeah, it, it's quite a um, it's quite striking how you know those those beautiful gospel images in Isaiah, which of course Isaiah actually preached chronologically before Jeremiah. But I mean, Jeremiah's preaching the the destruction. Isaiah's got the restoration, and not to I mean, right. the restoration comes in Jeremiah too. It, there's certainly gospel, but but the very the ones we know the best it seems are from the prophet Isaiah. It, it's I, I love that that right. contrast that you draw, draw there between this picture here. And Isaiah thirty-five of just that lush garden that springs up from the the wilderness. That's that's quite striking. We got about eight minutes here, Pastor Squire. I want to make sure we get to the end of our text because of the glimmers of hope that we get in the book of Jeremiah, particularly in the, these first several chapters. This is one of the stronger ones, I think. We we have a a call back from the Lord for His people. And, and it sounds like not just for his people, but also for other nations who are willing to to trust in him, to attach themselves to him as the one true God. Again, we got about eight minutes here. Help, help us into this, this last section, verses 14 to 17. So moving from the creation imagery and the desolation and the thorns that kind of harken back to this original curse and mm. all of this judgment that comes with Babylon coming, you do, like you said, you have this this glimmer of hope, and I suppose this is one of the stronger ones in Jeremiah because there isn't. You know, sometimes Isaiah is called the the fifth uh, evangelist, or you know, the, the evangelist of the Old Testament, for, because there are these very clear chapters of of beautiful gospel. And Jeremiah does have some, but not really quite as much. But at the end of chapter twelve here, he does have some words of hope, some words of good news for them. And the first one here in verses 14 and 15 is that he's going to pluck them up from their land. He will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. And so he seems to be referencing the people in exile now. So you remember that in uh, 586, the people of Judah and Jerusalem are taken in this final exile away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem's destroyed. The temple's burned down. The walls are knocked down. And for 70 years, the people are in exile in Babylon. And so that seems to be what he's talking about here is that he's going to take his people from among the nations and he's going to, verse 15, have compassion on them. And I will bring them again to his heritage and each to his land. So for Israel, at least, there is this idea that the exile is coming. It's going to be terrible. There's going to be a lot of bad stuff. And you read through Jeremiah and all the awful imagery from cannibalism to everything else, just all the stuff that's going to be happening during the siege of Jerusalem is not going to last forever. God's going to have compassion on them, bring them back. And it shall come to pass, verse 16, that if they diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, and they shall be built up in the midst of my people. So there is this sense, and whether explicitly or implied, that this is sort of that that fulfillment of what God called Jeremiah back in chapter one, that he is a prophet to the nations. And that's where I think this is a good segue into, you know, how does this 
carry on to the New Testament? How does this find its fulfillment in Jesus? Well, Jesus did come for the lost sheep of the people of Israel, but ultimately, of course, is the Savior of the world. So just as God is going to have compassion on his people by bringing them back from exile, so too is he also going to have compassion on all people through Jesus. So just as he promised to Abraham that the whole earth, all people will be blessed through him, this is where we get to Jesus. For those who listen to Jesus' word, for those who by faith are hearing and receiving and doing what the Lord says, and what he's done for them, obviously, that he's won for them salvation on the cross, that they will not simply inherit some country or some geographical location, but as Jesus says in Matthew 5.5, 5, that the meek are blessed because they will inherit the earth. So we have this sense then of a new creation. So all of this desolation that's happened, all of this destruction, everything that's caused by sin, all of the curses are going to be gone in Jesus. And this begins then, of course, when Jesus is raised from the dead. Paul calls him the first fruits in 1 Corinthians 15. But that means that more is going to come. And we see that at the end of Revelation, Revelation 21 and 22, that John sees this new heaven and new earth coming down from the sky and, and this new creation that, that we have been groaning for. This is Romans 8, that all of creation is groaning for the restoration of the sons of God and for the redemption of our bodies because it's in this hope that we are saved. So we see here in, in these words of Jeremiah this glimmer of hope and of restoration for all that's been desolate and destroyed. Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite a quite a promise there, and I, I appreciate you bringing out again from Jeremiah's call that he is the prophet to the nations. It's it's always very striking to me how how that just shows itself over and over again here in the book of Jeremiah. How what the Lord is telling his own people, Judah and Jerusalem, for their idolatry and the way that he's going to bring judgment upon them, how that ends up being a preaching to the nations as well. And and here also that as the Lord promises this return from exile, that that those nations who, you know, who surround them, even the ones that that touched his heritage at one point, they too have this this chance to repent, to learn to to call upon the name of the Lord truly rather than falsely as they'd been been teaching. Of course that that judgment is still there. I mean the 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 promise if it is not received in faith then the Lord says, "Well then the plucking up, the destroying, those words that were a part of Jeremiah's call, that will come as well." But just that extending of of hope both to Judah and Jerusalem and then to the nations around it is just a, a fantastic gospel promise here in in Jeremiah chapter 12. Any final thoughts here with just about a minute, Pastor Squire? Sure. Uh, you know, just in the Pentecost season, we have these readings from Acts, and you see Peter over and over preaching to people, you know, the nations, that you crucify Jesus. Uh, you crucify the Lord of life. And I think that's a good connection here to what Jeremiah says, that even those who have touched my heritage, you know, I think Jesus is the fulfillment of this, that the people who crucified Jesus are still hearing this word of hope and restoration, that even though we are all responsible for the worst act of evil in the history of the world in one way or another because of our sin. God vindicated Jesus, and in Jesus, he's bringing about new life and restoration. So a message for us today that is still relevant and applicable, that you still have people that are saying, peace, peace, where there's no peace, people that are scratching itching ears, people that will say anything to take Christians away from the Lord, and yet Christians still around the world are saying, how long, O Lord, but they're doing it in faith because we do have this promise. We've seen it in Jesus, and we will see it with our own eyes when he comes again to call us all to himself. Pastor Mark Squire is the pastor at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in St. Ansgar, Iowa, helping us today with Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 1 to 17. Pastor Squire, thanks for being our guest today. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about the book of Jeremiah or this series, any comments, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. Or you can download the KFUO app and use the open mic feature to record up to a 60-second message to send to us. We love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. 
talk to you again tomorrow.